Hey guys, welcome back to Coldrome. My name is Alex, and in this video, we're going to be talking about validation. So, validation is all about three basic things. First of all, it's about enforcing business logic. So, it's making sure that the input provided by the users actually complies with a given set of rules and validation formats that you expect it to adhere to. The second thing is, of course, preserving data integrity. So, we want to make sure that the data stored in our database follows the same exact format across the board. And the last one is to avert malicious inputs. So of course we can't trust any of the input provided by the client. So we have to make sure that that input doesn't harm our systems or doesn't alter the way that our application is working. So when it comes to validation in a GraphQL API service, there's of course several approaches that we might consider. One of them has to do with GraphQL directives. Now GraphQL directives are special language constructs and they allow you to apply logic to your queries. So for example, the GraphQL specification by Facebook comes with two built-in directives. One is include and the other one is skip. So this one allows you to conditionally include a subselection of fields on a query depending on a Boolean. So if the Boolean turns out to be true, then you want to select that subselection of fields. And then the skip directive works the exact same way, except if the Boolean is true, you want to skip the selection of fields. Now the include and skip directives in the spec are really only just the example. And of course we could create custom directives with Apollo and in fact, there's a package called GraphQL Constraint Directive. Let's actually look into it. What this one does is it defines a custom constraint directive and it allows you to apply custom validation like minimum length, maximum length. You could also apply formats. So for example, for an email address, you can apply the email format. You also have a bunch of other things. So for example, checking for characters that the string contains, checking for a specific pattern using regular expressions. So this is quite a versatile approach. But the disadvantages are that, well, first of all, this package doesn't actually allow you to define the constraint directives on query arguments. So what I mean by that is you can't actually have a, let's say, mutation. You can't put the constraint directive in next to the actual arguments to that mutation. So what ends up happening oftentimes is you create a separate input type with all of the arguments that your mutation expects, and then you can attach the constraint directive next to them. But if you wanted to list all of the arguments, you can't basically specify the constraint next to them. So that was one disadvantage. And the other one, and probably the more important one for us, is that unfortunately this package is not compatible with Apollo Server v2. And even if you make it work with the backwards compatible v1, you will actually get weird quirks with that library. Now, this package has actually been featured in a Apollo blog. And like I said, it does work for the most part with Apollo v1, but once again, you can sometimes run into weird behaviors with that version. So because we're gonna be using Apollo version two, we're gonna have to look into alternatives to GraphQL constraint directive. Now, the next approach that we can look into is doing validation inside of resolver functions. Now, what that basically means is you can go ahead and put the validation logic inside of your resolver functions. And in fact, if we go back to our project, I'm gonna go back to the user resolver. We have a query for a user. So we're trying to find a user by ID. But we first of all, have to check that the user ID provided by the client actually matches the mongoose object ID type. So we have a snippet of custom validation inside of the resolver function. If that validation check fails, then we basically throw in a built-in user input error exception object. And so this is one example of how you can do a validation inside of your resolvers. So this approach is very simple and intuitive. Putting the validation logic inside of the resolver functions would probably be the first thing you would reach out to do. But of course, there's quite a few disadvantages. And first of all, this approach is very repetitive. So you can imagine if you create more resolver functions or more objects for different models, you're gonna have the same type of validation across the different files. So it quickly starts to violate the drive principle. It also tends to clutter up very quickly and it doesn't actually scale beyond a few simple validation checks. So the more validation checks you add, the more complex and more elaborate your validation becomes inside of this file. So that has been resolver functions. Well, what else can we do? Let's say we decide that resolver functions are not optimized enough. So we could then look into utility functions. So what you can do is you can create pure functions using a library like validator.js. So if we look at this library, this one actually has quite a few useful methods. So for example, it has an export of is email method. So if we look at it, this one actually takes in an email address and it checks if the argument actually complies with the email format. So we also have things like is empty. We also have is Mongo ID. So this one checks if the argument is in fact a MongoDB object ID argument. And there's quite a few other things as well. So for example, checking 
or a phone number, checking the length of a string. There's actually a very vast selection of methods that you could pick from. So using our code base as an illustration, what we could do is we can basically take out this logic, this if condition, and we could create a utility function. So for example, we could call it is object ID. We could take in the ID argument in question and we can return an arrow function. We could basically have the if condition inside of it. So what we can do then is we can return either true or false depending on that condition or we could simply do the check and then if the check fails we could just throw out the exception itself. So this would be one way to do it and of course you could take out this function for instance we could create a utils file we could also create a function for it so let's do for example functions.js this would be sort of like utility functions that you could reuse across the project so we could have an export of that function is object id and then inside the resolver function you could basically call it like this, passing in the ID argument inside. I'm actually going to bring it back for the time being. So let me get rid of this utils folder. So back in our notes, this approach of course is simple enough and it's also quite composable. So you could actually turn those functions into higher order functions and you can actually chain them one after another. And this approach can actually scale. So it's a little bit better than the previous one. Now the cons of this approach is that we're actually pretty much reinventing the wheel. What I mean by that is that there's actually already validation libraries out there. So we're trying to roll out our custom solution. There's going to be downsides associated with that. And the second disadvantage is that, of course, this is more code to maintain because we're creating custom functions for validation. We're going to need to maintain all of that code. And we're also going to need to probably write unit tests for it. So it's basically only more code for us to take care of in our project. So let's say we want to move on beyond the utils. What will be the alternative way to utility functions? Well, we could actually take advantage of the built-in validation in Mongoose. So as it turns out, Mongoose as an ODM and as many other ORM libraries as well, actually comes with a lot of built-in validation methods that we can take advantage of. So for example, for number types, we have the validation for a minimum value of a number, maximum value, for strings, we also have enums. So for example, you could whitelist a set of values that you accept for a string. You can also use the required attribute. And of course, we have a bunch of other ones like lowercase, uppercase. We have min length, maximum length, match for regex expressions. There's actually quite a few of them that you could use. This approach also turns out to be quite extensible. So you could actually define custom validation logic with custom validators and you could actually customize the error messages themselves. So some of the downsides with this approach as I find is there's actually quite a few gotchas in Mongoose. So first of all you already saw the unique property. As it turns out it's not actually a validator but it's in fact a unique index. This is something we talked about a few videos ago so you might want to go back and check that one out. But then the other thing is that the update operations so for example update one or update mini. Well, those methods actually have validation turned off by default. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to pass in an option and manually turn on the validation if it wanted to be applied for our update operations. And the other caveat is that a lot of those update methods or operations don't actually trigger a lot of pre and post hooks. And this might be something to be mindful of as well. Now, the other thing that I found with Mongoose is that it's actually pretty hard to validate a subset of fields. So what ends up happening oftentimes is that you have a model, let's say a user model, which has an email field, username, name and password. Let's say the user is trying to reset the password. So you want to update the user model, but really only update the password field. So you're going to try to do a find by ID. And you're going to try to call the save method. So as it turns out, the save method is actually going to try to run validation on all of the fields of your model. So if some of those fields have, for example, unique constraints, so let's say the email cannot be duplicated, well, those constraints are actually going to fail. Now, there's ways around that, but once again, this is one of the caveats that we have to be mindful of. So like I said, validating a subset of fields is really not the easiest task in Mongoose. And then the other thing is that models oftentimes tend to grow out of size with Mongoose. So the more validation you add to your models, the more they're going to grow and the more difficult it's going to become to maintain them. Now, the last approach to validation we're going to talk about in this video is going to be object schema validation. So there's actually quite a few libraries for validation of objects. One of the most popular ones is AJV. This one is actually optimized for performance. So in fact, as they claim, it's actually one of the fastest libraries for validating JSON objects. It has a tremendous number of downloads per week, but the only downside is that it's actually pretty boilerplate heavy. 
So if you actually want to do validation on your objects, you have to be ready to write out quite a complicated and cumbersome boilerplate to perform that validation. So it's more of a low level library, like I said, but a more expressive library would be something like Scheme that's come out recently and it actually has the same validation pattern as Mongoose. So you could define the same types of objects. So things like string and number regex, you could also pass in custom validators. So you can provide a custom logic to validate those fields. Of course, you could also customize the error messages. I would have used this library. And in fact, it has a very similar API to Mongoose. It seems to be quite compatible with it, but the only downside is that this library is not very popular yet. So most often you would probably see a library like Joy used on the server side with Node.js. Joy is a very, very popular library for validation. It's currently at version 14 and it's been evolving for quite a few years now. And the thing that I really like is that it has a very expressive API. So for example, to validate an object that has, let's say, username, password, access token. So you could imagine that this could be, let's say, a user object. If you want to validate that object, you could create a schema for it. So you call in joy object, you can pass in the list of keys for that object, and then you can start validating them. So for example, you could validate a string, you could tell it to be alphanumeric, you could also set the minimum length, the maximum length, you could specify the field to be required, you could also use the utility email method. And of course, you have access to things like regex and a lot of other things as well. So it's a very useful library service side. Now for browsers, there's also a library called Yup. This one is actually used in Formic. But because we're going to be doing validation, primarily on the server side, we're going to be using joy. So joy is very expressive and readable. Like I said, it has a very understandable and straightforward API. It's also very dry and it doesn't really clutter up as much as resolvers or util methods do. And of course, it's also extensible and customizable. So you could of course create your custom validators, you could also create plugins. And of course, you can define custom error messages as well. Now, one of the downsides is that the default messages in joy are actually pretty cryptic. But like I said, they're still customizable. So there's ways around that. So what we're going to do for this tutorial is we're going to use joy for validation. So let me go back to my terminal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a yarn add joy. So let's add it as a dependency. Let's go back in here. And in fact, since we are looking at the user model, I want to make a small correction to the previous video. You may or may not know that Mongoose has been an evolving library. In fact, it's been around even before promises have been introduced in Node.js and definitely way before the async await syntax has been added to the spec of ECMAScript. Now, because of that, previously Mongoose mostly worked with callbacks and that's because we had to pass in an argument with the next callback and we also had to manually call it from our code. But as it turns out, if we're using the async await syntax, we can actually get rid of the next callback. We don't actually need to call it as it turns out. So we can basically just remove that try catch. And I'm also going to remove the callback from the function itself. Now, as far as having a try catch, this function can of course fail. And it could fail, for example, if you pass in an undefined instead of an actual string. But this is what validation is going to be used for. So this is going to be the next step for us to look into. 